Hello, hello. My name is David Joe. I'm a senior here at Bowdoin and I study physics. It is nice to see that there's so much interest in astronomy uh, from fellow polar bears. Um, but before we get into that, there are a couple of housekeeping items that I need to go through. Um, first, closed captioning is available in the menu below if you need it or want it. Um, and then second, the Q&A box will be open throughout the presentation. So if you have questions, uh, send them through there. And the more questions we get, the better the presentation will be. So if you want to help us out with that, that'd be, that would be great. Um, and finally, uh, before I introduce our presenter today, uh, know that I love him very much and that any mean jokes that he might make at me or any mean jokes that I might make at him are, are made with love. Uh, so with that out of the way, uh, he's my former physics one lab instructor, uh, a big dork and an amateur, amateur astronomer and astrophotographer. And I think his name is like Phil or something. So either way, or something. Yep. take it away. <laughs> Thanks, David. Uh, yeah, no, I have to, yeah, a lot of love. Uh, it, so David was, uh, I started teaching a boat uh, as a live instructor uh, just four years ago, uh, almost exactly. Um, and uh, David was it, uh, in my, first, I started that semester uh, in the class that David was in. And, and, and more specifically, the very first class that I taught, uh, David was in. And, um, you know, it, it, so here we are, he's going to graduate. And look at him, he's all grown up. Um, so that's, that's cool beans. All righty. Uh, so we're going to talk about, um, let's see, we got uh, history of astronomy and we're going to, uh, we're going to cover 5,000 years in, uh, what, 45 minutes? Uh, I don't know, what's that, 100 years a minute or more? So that means we got to get going. So, uh, but I can't do anything unless I share my screen. So let's try that. Okay, uh, share. There it goes. And play. All right. Hopefully, everyone sees David. Can you confirm? Uh, is Aristotle and and Vera Rubin? Yep, that's I can see it. Perfect. All righty. All right. Like I said, we got a lot to a lot of years to cover here. So let's start by talking about astronomy before history. Uh, and by definition, we have no written record of astronomy before history. Yes, correct. We have no text. But we do have some leftovers, we think. Uh, well, no, we know, I'll, and I'll show you those. Uh, but, and, and I think we can make some assumptions as well, like the night skies uh, were probably important, uh, and solar events important uh, to uh, Stone Age people uh, for cultural, religious, and uh, some practical reasons as well. And in particular, knowing when the equinoxes and solstices come around. Uh, the last of the three major um, Stone Ages is the Neolithic, and the, Neol the, Neol the Neolithic Revolution is characterized by uh, when um, I guess all of us started decided that you know farming was a good thing, and it was. There were some drawbacks, but that you know there we are. So farming is a thing, and so there'd be a particular interest, I think, in the winter solstice. Uh, that would, if you knew exactly when that was, you'd know about when you should start thinking about getting your crops ready and such, and you knew that. Winter was at least not getting worse, so uh, you know maybe there'd be a party or something. So this thing is uh, called a solar graph, uh, and it is a basically a six-month exposure uh, facing south, and you can see the sun has uh, traced across the, the camera field of view, and, and you know in here it's very you know, lots of sunny days, so that's would have been a good time to take your vacation and not so much here, uh, but you get the idea. And so this lowest one would be right around, if not in, in fact, exactly the winter solstice, lowest, the sun is lowest in the sky then. And then uh, a little bit off the screen would be the summer solstice way up top and everything else in between. So the sun gets uh, higher, uh, well, reaches its lower, lowest point of the winter solstice. And also, uh, the point of sunrise, which is over here, uh, marches eastward uh, as we go from summer to winter uh, until it reaches its most, uh, I'm sorry, southward from the east, I should say, it reaches its south most southerly extent. And of course, the exact um, converse happens at sunset. 
So here we have the uh, megalithic passage tomb in Newgrange, Ireland. You can visit it. And they went to a great deal of trouble, built this enormous, I mean, it's huge, structure. And it does one thing. It has um, a, a tunnel built into it. And to this day, right around the, summer, uh, the winter solstice, uh, and plus or minus a day or so, at sunrise, the sun manages to get all the way through the tunnel and to the center, which presumably people would be gathered in maybe hoisting glasses of mead or something like that. So let's skip ahead. Uh, let's see, about, well, a few thousand years. Yeah, that, that took a chunk out of the 5,000. And here we have uh, Plato and, uh, and Aristotle. He was, Aristotle was a student of Plato. And they couldn't, the ancient Greeks couldn't do a lot of observational uh, astronomy. They just didn't have the instruments. But they could sit and think. And so Aristotle does that. And he starts with, with what he calls first principles. And those principles are that the Earth is imperfect. Hard to argue with that one. Uh, the heavens are perfect. Ooh, I don't know, maybe. I'll let them have that one. A sphere is the most perfect solid shape. I kind of like that one. And smooth motion is the most perfect motion. So from that, from those um, principles, if you like, uh, Aristotle concludes that the Earth is at the center of the universe. And uh, it surely looks that way. And uh, we wouldn't want to be at the center of the universe, uh, right, David? What are you trying to say? Hmm? <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> The planets, the sun, and the moon are perfect spheres, according to Aristotle, and, and in turn are affixed to spheres and move at constant velocity. And uh, also, the Greeks noticed that the Earth is spherical, and they find that from, so they were clever, from lunar eclipses. Uh, this is a picture I took a while back, uh, a sequence of pictures from a lunar eclipse. And now I'm going to overlay to scale uh, the Earth. And of course, the uh, shadow uh, from the Earth uh, on the Moon, and you can see that, uh, yeah, the Greeks pretty much had it right. Uh, the uh, The conclusion is that the Earth is spherical, or at least very, if not a perfect sphere, very close. And uh, I said they didn't do a lot of uh, testing, but they but they did what they could. And uh, then we have this fellow Aristophanes, and what he did. Uh, he was in, in uh, present-day Aswan, which is about 23 and a half degrees north of the equator, which just happens to be the, uh, um, uh, the highest point that the sun reaches. And he noticed that uh, on a particular, in a certain well, uh, at the summer solstice, the sunlight reached the bottom of the well. And then he thought, well, you know what? I'm going to take a trip pretty much due north to uh, Alexandria, which is about 800 kilometers north. And I'm going to put a stick in the ground straight up, and when the summer, uh, the day of the summer solstice comes around, I'm going to measure the angle of the shadow. And from all of that, it's not too hard to work out the uh, circumference of the Earth. Aristophanes did that, and astonishingly came up with uh, an answer that is within, it depends on exactly how you define a stadia, nobody's quite sure, but it uh, comes within a few percent of the accepted value today. Uh, that was a long time ago, and it's hard to find a picture of Aristophanes, but here's a very rare picture that I managed to, to find. There are some other so-called supporting observations. Uh, one is that uh, if the Earth was moving, they, they thought, you would feel it, you know, it would shake along like a chariot or something. And so, but that doesn't happen, so that, that means it's not moving. And also, if it was moving, when you throw something up in the air, it ought to come back down where it came from, which is, of course, what, well, mostly what we see, except in this case over here. And um, that's, uh, fortunately, that's not the Red Sox. So, uh, so Aristotle has his model, and uh, the good news is, for him at least, I guess, it's supported by dogma. There were some problems with it, uh, most notably the retrograde motion of the outer planets, um, especially Mars, it's most pronounced. I'll talk more about that in a minute. And the model was not accurate. Uh, here's, here's why Mars does uh, retrograde motion. 
So this is, the, of course, the modern understanding of where things are. There's Earth, uh, and being in an orbit which is closer to the sun, things closer to the thing that they're orbiting, have a higher, both higher linear velocity and angular velocity, both of those things. And uh, this other one that's further out is Mars. And you can see that the Earth catches up to Mars uh, and then surpasses it. And the line of sight, as you look at Mars, traces out the apparent position of Mars in the sky. And uh, about once every two years, we get this, this retrograde motion where Mars appears to slow down, uh, stop, and then go backward, slow down again, and continue on its way. So this was a big, big problem for the Aristotle model. So Ptolemy comes along and says, well, I'll fix that. And he says, hey, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put Mars and, and well, all the other ones, too, but I'm just showing Mars. I'm going to put it on a bicycle wheel, and then I'm going to attach that bicycle wheel to yet another bicycle wheel. And by the way, while I'm at it, I'm not going to center because that doesn't really give me, uh, that gives me the epicycle, but not the right motion. So I'm not going to attach it to Earth. I'm going to attach it to something called an eccentric, and that doesn't really quite work either, so I'm going to govern the speed from the equine. Following all that? Uh, yeah. Uh, and he really didn't stop with that either. It got more complicated as time went on, and I guess you could say that this is definitely a highly contrived model. At the cycle's deference in eccentrics and equines, oh my. A good theory is often an elegant theory is simple and elegant and I think I think we can all agree this this thing is not very elegant so now we're going to skip over the dark ages because pretty much nothing happened uh, unless we count Monty Python that that happened but nothing else and we come to uh, Copernicus and Copernicus says, hey, you know what? I've thought about this stuff in the retrograde motion and things, and it would make a lot more sense if the sun was at the center of the solar system. And he publishes a little a, a pamphlet called Little Comment. He's uh, more than fully aware of the heretic unfriendly um, environment uh, because of uh, what was going on with Martin Luther at the time. So he's very conservative in his little comment. And, uh, but he, uh, he continues working on, um, on his masterwork, Revolution Bis, uh, Orbium Celestium, uh, on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres, which is published the year after he dies. So it's kind of hard to lock him up if he's dead. And Revolution Bis explained, you know, as we just saw in a very simple and elegant way, why Mars does what Mars does. So, this is cool. What happened? Well, not much. At least right away. An unauthorized uh, introduction was inserted that said that, uh, don't panic, it's okay. He's just using this as a model. Okay, we're not upsetting the world order here. It's just, it's just a kind of technique. And it didn't help that his predictions, the, model, the predictions from the model, were no better, in fact, really worse than the current uh, Ptolemaic model, which you know had the advantage of 1,500 years of uh, refinement. Uh, they were probably up to 52 levels of cycles or something. And the reason it didn't work very well is because um, Copernicus had the uh, orbits as circular, and um, they're not. And you couldn't. It, 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 even if it was a great model, you know, there was nothing that you could, there was no observational support that um, could dethrone a, a geocentric model. Now, this guy, probably the most interesting fellow that we're going to talk about, this is Tico Bryant. Uh, over here, that's his nose, this is Tico. Uh, he was officious and arrogant. So like you in, in, in the lab. Yes, yes, exactly. Tico's pride was injured by a third cousin. Uh, they were both at university, and the third cousin said, hey, I'm a better mathematician than you are. And in a stroke of genius, they uh, decided that um, at night 
there's no artificial illumination. They'd go out on the quad with, armed with their swords, and they would fight it out. Exactly how that shows who is the better mathematician, I'm not quite sure, but I can tell you that Pico lost his nose, and he wore this fake nose uh, for the rest of his life. So after he uh, finishes college, uh, there's the, su the supernova of 15... Uh, 72 uh, in the constellation Cassiopeia, which is circumpolar uh, for most parts of the northern hemisphere. So you can see it all the time, no, any season. Uh, and this uh, this astonished Tycho and pretty much everyone else. And he uh, publishes a small book called uh, De Stella Nova, the New Star. And Danish uh, King Frederick II uh, sees this book and uh, thinks a lot of Tycho. And he gives him an enormous sum of money and an entire island. Tico comes down with a bad case of Nuva Reach and builds this um, astonishing castle and, uh, um, and his observing instrument as well. And he also employed a dwarf as a jester and a pet elf, which he got drunk. And the elf stumbled on its way down the stairs and broke a plug and died. Um, yeah, weird guy. Pretty him. weird guy. Yeah. <laughs> A weird, a weird guy with a fake nose. I mean, you, you, weird guys you see all the time, but with a with a brass nose, that's you know, Fair that's enough. a special thing. That's a special, yeah. But he does make exquisitely accurate astrometric observations uh, using a personality trait that has uh, that is usually uh, said with two words, and the second word is retentive. His royal patron, King Frederick, dies. Of excessive drink, and by then he had managed to tick everyone off in Denmark. So he he got out of Dodge, goes to Prague, and where he dies of excessive drink, uh, but not before he hired a fellow by the name of Kepler. Here we have Kepler. Now Kepler is an interesting guy as well. Maybe not as interesting as Pico, but uh, he was a Copernican, right? And he was also a numerologist, so he's looking for these mystical connections and stuff. And he had all of Tico's data, so he painstakingly plotted all of Tico's data and uh, calculated and stuff. And after several years, maybe three or four years, it wasn't really very hard, he makes three astonishing discoveries called Kepler's law, Laws. So K1 is that planets go around in ellipses. Remember Copernicus and his trouble with circular orbits. So now we have elliptical orbits, which is correct. Uh, he also um, discovers K2, which says that in equal uh, time, so each one of these um, sectors is an equal amount of time, and this, the area of each one of these is, is the same as everyone else. And, uh, and the third one, maybe most astonishing of all, is that the period of uh, any, it's not just the planets, it applies everywhere, but let's just talk about planets. The period of the planet squared is proportional to the semi-major axis A cubed. Now, if you state that, um, if you use the units of years and astronomical units at the distance from the Earth to the Sun, it's actually P squared equals A cubed. You can use other units and, and you have to put some constants in there. This is the very definition of elegant. And it was extremely accurate. In fact, for all intents and purposes, we continue to use Kepler's laws to this day. But it is, the lovely model that it is, and accurate, it is, after all, a model. So somebody who really wants to have a geocentric universe can say, great, you have this cool model, but that's all it is, is a model. Which brings us to Galileo. He did not invent the telescope. Some people think that. But he does seem to have uh, the first person with a good sense to point a telescope. They were common at the time. Point, point his telescope at the stars. What, what was everyone else pointing their telescopes to? Their neighbor's window or something? I think they were. <laughs> <laughs> so what did Galileo see when he pointed his telescope not at the neighbor's window but up in the sky? He sees craters on the moon. And yeah. that means, yeah. The heavenly right. spheres are not perfect. Right. Yeah, that's right. 
sunspot. The heavenly spheres are not perfect. Moons circling Jupiter that stayed with Jupiter. And Jupiter isn't even a sphere. No, it's an oval, uh, really flattened oval. It, it goes around in 10 hours, as it turns out, very fast, and then it flattens out because of that. And here's, you know, here's the, the master stroke. Venus has full phases. It starts as uh, fully illuminated uh, in a cycle and then goes around um, uh, half illuminated into a crescent. And it also changes size during that progression. So to remind you, here's the geocentric model and the reason why it cannot ac uh, accommodate that observation. Uh, we have uh, this uh, sort of rigid rod that goes between the Earth and the Sun, and then there's the bicycle wheels that Mercury and Venus are attached to. And you can see that in this model, at least, nobody on Earth is ever going to see anything more than uh, a crescent, at most, from either Venus or Mercury. And then, of course, here's the uh, correct heliocentric model. There's Earth, there's Venus, and you get to see the full range of phases, and you also would notice, of course, that uh, Venus being further away here, and when it's nearly full, it's small. It appears to be small, and then um, when it's a crescent, it appears to be bigger. So, uh, yeah, it fits perfectly. So, Venus had phases, uh, imperfect heavens, and so forth, and anyone with a telescope could just take it out and uh, see for themselves. This is kind of hard to argue with. So Galileo publishes uh, a bestseller, it, it uh, sells out, uh, Dialogue on Two Chief World Systems. Yeah, the Pope's not too happy about it. And uh, for some reason, uh, David thinks I'm weird, but I, I think that uh, Galileo looks like uh, Orson Welles. Or maybe you have to say that Orson Welles looks like Galileo. Uh, reincarnation. Either way, you need your glasses checked. <laughs> <laughs> yep. OK. All right, great. So we have a how. That's, that's awesome. And it sure looks very convincing, but we don't have a why. Which brings us to this fellow, uh, Newton, Isaac Newton. Uh, Newton dabbled in alchemy. Not too many people know that. So Newton intuited that the effect of gravity from an isotropic spherical mass, what does that mean, isotropic sphere? Think of an onion, right? So an onion has layers, and the different layers uh, might have different density, let's say, but from the center of the onion, uh, no matter which way you look, uh, isotropic, uh, the composition is the same, right? So it, so long as you, just subject to that one restriction, then you, this is his intuition, you consider uh, the entire mass of the onion to be as if it is concentrated at its center. But the mathematics of the time uh, couldn't prove that, so what did Newton do? He, well, he does what, it, what, we, what I'll do. He invents calculus <laughs> on his summer vacation during a pandemic. I'm also inventing something, too, by the really? way. Really? Yeah. I, I mean, I can't, I can't tell you because I wouldn't want you to steal credit for it, but uh, um, yeah. Wow. Wow. Is it like calculus? Yeah, yeah, revolutionary. Everyone's going to be blown away. <laughs> yeah, awesome. All right, so uh, there we are. Uh, so we have some observational, uh, some you know, deadly convincing observational um, confirmation. And so we're finally on board with the heliocentric model, and we build bigger and better telescopes. Uh, Bill Herschel, his friends know him as Bill, uh, constructs a, his own telescope, as it turns out. And uh, during one of his times outside looking uh, at the sky, he discovers Uranus. You have to say that name very carefully. Well done. Very, very carefully. Yep. Uh, so after some time of observing uh, and cataloging where, where Uranus goes and what its position is and such, uh, Leverrier has a bunch of data to look over. And he notices that Uranus's movement is not exactly what you would think has some perturbations, periodic per perturbations. And it works out that in his, in his, he thinks, and he, and he turns out to be right, that uh, an eighth planet um, beyond uh, Uranus would, uh, would account for what he sees. 
So he writes to German uh, astronomer Johann Gall at the uh, Berlin Observatory and says, hey, I think, there's, I think there's another planet and here's where to look. And on the same night, same night that Gall gets Bavaria's letter, he discovers Neptune. Which is uh, I, that's just a wonderful story. That brings us to William Parsons, and his friends called him William. He's the third, Ro uh, let's see, the third Earl of Ross. There we go, third Earl of Ross. And he builds the Leviathan of Parsonstown. It was, I mean, this, is, this thing is huge, even by modern standards. Um, there he is. I think girls must have um, a lot of free time on the hand. What do you think, David? Yeah, and plenty of free time. And when did he figure out that it's better to use it at night? All that free time. <laughs> Uh, and when his eyes started, hurting, I think maybe who knows. Good point. Oh, well, by the way, you can visit that thing at, at Burr Castle in, in um, Ireland, Scotland. Sure. In any event, uh, one of the things that he discovers is what we uh, now call uh, Messier Object Fifty One and other uh, so-called nebulae. Um, but he correctly surmises that it, it's not just a blob of gas; it's an in Entire galaxy outside of outside of the Milky Way, but similar to the Milky Way, and, and part of the reason that he um, includes that is because he can discern individual stars uh, in the in galaxy. And there was no photography at the time, so he makes a sketch. But look at how that's amazing. So, you know, he really did see M fifty one. So all of a sudden, now the universe got a lot bigger, right? Uh, we don't just have the Milky Way. We have these. Uh, we have M51, but of course, in um, even a very modest telescope, we can see all kinds of galaxies. So things got a lot bigger. Now, um, take a little side step here. Olbers, uh, Heinrich Olbers, um, poses a paradox. He says, if the universe is infinite in extent, and it's kind of hard for it not to be, right? If I say, hey, it only goes this far, and I build a brick wall, well, you know, what's, what's after the brick wall, you know, uh, well, more universe, I guess. So if the universe is, is infinite in extent, then why is the night sky dark? Sounds like a silly question, but it's really profound. So stars are small as we uh, view them from the Earth, but they're not, they have not zero, they're not actual points of light, they have a diameter. And if you start stacking them up, I mean, if it's in, if the universe, if you can go an infinite distance, you can stack a lot of stars. And eventually, it's inevitable that anywhere you look, your line of sight will land on the surface of a star. So the night sky should be as bright as the surface of a star. There is nothing wrong with this logic. There is a solution. And actually, the first person is, who solved the, uh, the paradox uh, is a little bit surprising. I'll, I'll let you in on it at the end. And uh, we, we leave the 17 and 1800s uh, into the late 1800s, uh, where finally we have photography, uh, which gives us photometry and spectroscopy. Uh, this fellow here in the back, uh, that's uh, Edward Pickering. A director of the Harvard College Observatory. The College of the Observatory was accumulating lots and lots of glass photographic plates being taken at telescopes all over the world. Uh, some were direct images, others were spectrographs. And Pickering wanted to catalog all of that data in some way. But he gets frustrated with the men working on the project and said, my Scottish maid could do better. And then he did just that, and more. Why they're standing like paper dolls there, I don't know, faintest idea. One of them was Wilhelmina Fleming. She moved from Dundee, Scotland, to Boston with her husband. Uh, while in Boston, she became pregnant, and then um, her husband ran away. Okay. Uh, she needed a job, so Pickering hired her as a housemaid. So this is the housemaid, the Scottish housemaid he's talking about. And um, and then uh, so he puts her to work, and she, all she did was discover 10 novae, 310 wearable stars, 52 nebulae, including the famous Horsehead Nebula, and did that while she was also in charge of all of the other computers. That's what their name, that's what their job title was. 
and uh, carrying out other administrative duties and being a single mom. Another one of the computers, Annie Jump Cannon. She invents the famous Obia Fine uh, girl guy, and kiss me, OB, O-B-A-F-G-K-M, a stellar sequence uh, based on um, spectrographic uh, 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 signatures. There we are. And she, by herself, um, classifies 400,000 400, stars. Cecilia Gapashkin, she earned the first PhD in astronomy ever awarded by Radcliffe College. And uh, her thesis was uh, saying that the most common thing that you find in a star is hydrogen and helium, which of course is correct. And uh, Ardo Struve had nice things to say about that. Um, most brilliant PhD thesis ever. And I suspect that, I suspect that at the time, at least uh, he was right. Uh, we, we also have Antonio Mari. And she graduated from Vassar with uh, degrees in physics, philosophy, and astronomy, that's all. And she was the first woman to lead a uh, major paper, uh, lead author on a major paper, uh, which uh, dealt with spectrographic uh, analysis. And she came up with some new ways to uh, catalog, to distinguish stars you know, via spectra. Uh, Henrietta Swan Levitt, she discovers Cepheid variables. Uh, this is really important. So a Cepheid variable star uh, gets brighter, gets dimmer, and she finds that the rate at which it gets brighter and dimmer, the period, is directly proportional to its intrinsic luminosity. This is huge. So you can measure the period of a Cepheid. That's, that's really easy. Just keep looking at the same star night after night and wait for it to come around to the same brightness. There you go. There's your period. You also now know, because of Henrietta Swan and Levitt, that it is intrinsically this amount bright. So that lets you, uh, that's a standard, what's called a standard candle, uh, the same way you might judge distance of a, of a distant light if you have to know exactly how bright it is. Um, if the Cepheid happens to be part of a galaxy, an external galaxy, then you know how far away the galaxy is, and that clears the deck for Slifer and Hubble to discover the cosmic redshift, which is the expansion of the universe. So, not so bad. Scottish made and about a dozen computers. Uh, we move on to uh, Einstein in 1922. He discovers, or uh, well, I guess he discovered, but publishes his general, his theory of general relativity, uh, which says that we live in a four dimensional world. Uh, it's not space plus time, it is space time, four dimensions. Uh, it's often visualized this, this way because us puny humans with our, our meager brains can't, I know I can't imagine four dimensions. Um, so it's uh, often illustrated this way. I mean, here's a big heavy thing and a not so heavy thing. And the big heavy thing uh, bends space time, or at least it seems that way to us. Uh, light follows a straight line in four dimensional space, but uh, we don't really kind of get that. So uh, to us three dimensional beings, we think that it, it is bent. Here's an amazing photograph taken by the Hubble of uh, Abel uh, 2218. It's a very uh, dense and very massive cluster of galaxies. And there's enough mass there that background galaxies are extremely strong, it's called strong lenses. Uh, so this is, these arcs over here, it's all the same galaxy, uh, been lensed again and again and again. Uh, and, and that galaxy is way, way, way in the background. In fact, I think this same Cluster of galaxies, this lens was used to discover the furthest object in the universe ever, ever observed. So we can have some fun with uh, general relativity. Uh, Schwarzschild certainly did, and he works out that uh, from Einstein's equations that uh, something called black holes are possible, which of course we've now observed um, indirectly. Uh, well, no, there's a new direct observation. In 1922, the same year that Einstein publishes equations, uh, Friedman solves the, those equations where he takes the universe and figures, uh, determines that the universe can do one of three things. It can either be uh, closed, which means that it expands and then comes back. Uh, this is all based on the uh, mean density um, of the universe. So if the mean density of the universe is, is more than a certain amount, 
then the universe is closed and it comes back to a, a big crunch after the Big Bang. And if it's less than that certain amount, it opens, which means it just keeps going and going. And uh, if it's balanced just exactly right, it's flat, which seems highly improbable. But David, I learned yesterday you're working on one of the reasons why. It, this is called the flatness problem. You know, why is the universe flat? And uh, inflation, right? That, that's your senior thesis, is it not? Yeah, so basically one, one proposed solution to the flatness problem or one of the proposed theories for you know, addressing why the universe is so perfectly flat um, is that um, very early on in the universe, the universe uh, went through this very fast period of exponential expansion. Um, and in a way that would sort of flatten out any... Um, uh, energy densities in any particular local area. So that's to say, it looks like our universe is very flat because it's just been any sort of um, disruptions in the flatness gets smoothed away by that rapid expansion. Okay, so kind of like if I was to lay down under a steamroller, uh, my, my flatness would be improved. It's one way to look <laughs> at it. <laughs> Thank you, David. That, that's fascinating. I really do look forward to hearing your um, uh, your talk uh, coming up soon, I guess. All right, well, anyway, so uh, Einstein didn't like any of those versions. He preferred, on uh, aesthetic grounds, he thought that the universe should be constant, not changing. And uh, to make that work, uh, he introduces uh, the ad hoc cosmological constant. It's kind of like a pressure um, uh, to keep the universe static. Uh, so but at this point, uh, the, uh, the, uh, this is all theorizing about the, the state. De Sitter says that the universe cannot be uh, static. It's either expanding or contracting, but it can't be standing still. Uh, Hubble comes along, and maybe the second most notorious guy on, in, uh, today. He, uh, he, he studied uh, Queen's College, Oxford for a while, liked uh, the British uh, culture so much that the rest of his life he had a fake British accent uh, and uh, mannerisms. <laughs> and was generally, by all reports, completely insufferable. And it looks like he was a fan of tweed jackets. Yes, that would fit, and look, this is amazing. He had, there's his pipe, right? Yeah, so you're gonna, you're gonna have to you gotta have a pipe. In an observatory, like, no, 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 get that out of here, no pipes. Uh, here he is, he, he looks grumpy because somebody took his pipe away. Uh, he uses Swan Levitt Cepheids to get distances to a few dozen uh, galaxies and also took redshift data. So redshift is like a Doppler effect kind of thing to get the recessional speed. So now he has two things. He has a, a distance to a galaxy and he has a recessional speed. He plots that out and he finds that amazingly that the uh, recessional speed increases linearly with distance to the, um, the galaxy, which is exactly what you would expect and we now expect. And um, so the universe is expanding. And then if you run time backwards in your mind, and if it's expanding out, you go backwards, and there must have been a, a point where everything was very dense and, and piled in together, uh, which we, of course, we now call the Big Bang. This did not make Einstein happy. Uh, he called the cosmological constant his greatest blunder. David, I've seen some of your blunders. Um, you know, those, that was four years ago. <laughs> and they weren't that bad. <laughs> yeah, I got to admit. And, and it's not like getting the universe wrong. So we have, uh, we have an expanding universe according to Hubble. And uh, we think that that would necessarily mean a Big Bang. This is Arno uh, Penzias and Robert Wilson uh, standing underneath their big antenna. They were working at Bell Labs uh, to perfect satellite communication using microwave communication antennas. But there was this uh, persistent hiss that was troubling them in their, in their uh, use of the uh, uh, telescope, I guess you'd have to say. Uh, at one point, they even thought that maybe it was because of uh, pigeon poop, which they cleaned out. Uh, but it still wouldn't go away, and they eventually uh, decided that, uh, you know, what we're listening to, what we're hearing is the remnant of the Big Bang the heat left over. And if you do the calculation, you expect that the leftover temperature from the Big Bang ought to be about 0.7 or so degrees Kelvin. 
and that is exactly what uh, uh, Penzi Wilson and Penzi have saw. Uh, this is a, a more recent data from a, from a satellite, and uh, plotted in green is the theoretical black body curve, and of course the red cross is the data. And then say that the agreement with the theory is, is good is something of an under, understatement. Uh, in terms, so you have a big bang. Uh, uh, that means that uh, after you start out with this soup of uh, quarks and whatever, you know, it's very high temperature. Uh, but eventually, things you know, get a little cooler, and you can start um, uh, condensing nuclei. And uh, and then the uh, later come the electrons to join the nuclei, so you get atoms. And the question is, well, how much of everything do you make? Uh, so Ralph Alpher and uh, his PhD supervisor George Gamow they write a paper on this uh, on this topic. Uh, they ask Hans Beta, a friend of his, if it would be okay if they list him as an author as well, uh, which he agrees to. It's an amazing paper, but it's also the the, the most uh, famous and probably one of the very worst is this dad jokes um, ever perpetrated because uh, the reason they wanted uh, Hans Beta is so that they could do Alpha, Beta, Gamma, the first three letters of the Greek alphabet. Man, that's a knee slapper, huh? If you didn't <laughs> tell me, if you didn't tell me that it was a joke. <laughs> right. I got it. Right? Yeah, yeah. Well, wait until you, you know, you're not a dad yet. So it, it'll, you know, that, that sense will come. <laughs> Jocelyn Bell, she discovers pulsars while working as a postdoc at Cambridge. Uh, what she notices is some very, very regular uh, radio pulses, extremely regular. Uh, in a uh, sort of tongue-in-cheek, she labels her uh, strip chart and her notes as LGM1, which stands for Little Green Men, because it's hard to imagine uh, a natural source as opposed to a technological source that is so regular. But it, it, she didn't really think that. But uh, it was it, this. This is. Higher quality, I think, than Alpha Beta Gamma. But I'm not sure. Her supervisor uh, is awarded the Nobel Prize for the discovery, but Bell is not. And that's okay. Bell got her. Uh, no, she she got her comeuppance. Uh, so here's um, Hewitt's uh, uh, share of the Nobel Prize, about six hundred fifty thousand dollars. That's not nothing, but. A few years ago, uh, she was awarded the Breakthrough Prize, in the only, the sole recipient, uh, three million dollars. So I, you know, I, I think Bell came out. No word on what Hewitt did with his money. This is Wendy Friedman. She was uh, the uh, co-principal investigator on the Hubble Space Telescope Key Project, whose goal was to refine the value of the Hubble constant, which is a fundamental thing that we really want to know. Well, she used uh, Cepheids going all the way back to Henrietta Swan Levitt uh, and also type 1A supernovae as standard candles in, uh, in external galaxies. Here's Sandy Faber. Uh, it's hard to mention all the things that she did. Uh, she developed the Faber-Jackson relationship. Uh, which is a, a standard candle for gigantic elliptical galaxies, which of course are very, very bright. That means that the distance ladder can go much further now. Uh, she showed that dark matter can't be neutrinos. Uh, they, neutrinos interact by the weak force, which is great. That, that's a good thing, but uh, their mass isn't right. So he, she said that hey, it must be a slower moving uh, particle. Uh, uh, neutrinos also go about the speed of light uh, by the weak Force, uh, so known as uh, weakly interacting massive particles or WIMPs. She was involved in commissioning the Hubble Space Telescope and famously diagnosing uh, a bad case of uh, spherical aberration and lots of other things. I can't list them all. Here's Obama awarding uh, Sandy, everybody knows her as Sandy, uh, the National uh, Medal of Science, which um, well deserved, needless to say. And come to uh, the last person I'm going to profile, which is Vera Rubin. I met Ver Vera Rubin uh, uh, a while back, a wonderful person. What she did is she observed spiral galaxies. And so the case for dark matter had been made pretty well, uh, but not in the case of individual galaxies. So she 
observed spiral galaxies explicitly plotted the rate at which the stars go around. So remember we had that thing with Mars and Earth, and I said that the angular and the linear velocity uh, increase as you go towards the center and decrease as you go out. Well, that's not how it ought to be for galaxies. The center of the galaxy is overwhelmingly where all the mass is. So you expect, you expect the rotation curve to do something like this here in the blue line. So that's what's called a Keplerian uh, um, fall off. If you, if you do the very simple math, you find that it goes as uh, one over the square root of the heart. But that's not what we see, uh, uh, as Vera Rubin found, and found that uh, the uh, rotation curve remains high. And so that demands the existence of something else that somehow creates uh, either the appearance of gravity or actual gravity. So some current mysteries. Let me just finish up with that. Uh, dark matter is one of them. We know, we know tons about where dark matter is, and we know lots and lots and lots about what it is, but we don't have really any idea of what it is. So David, what's the first rule when you encounter something and you have no clue what it is? Well, if you want people to think that you're smart, you give it a name. <laughs> exactly. Give it a name. Hey, he knows what he's talking about, or she knows what. Right, so we call it dark matter. Uh, okay, and that's because, well, it's dark. Can't see it. Can't see it. No, not, not even a little. Uh, and as far as the matter part goes, well, maybe. It might be wimps. People have been looking now for a long time for wimps, and we haven't found any. There's other people that have been, that are fiddling with gravity laws, uh, both uh, sort of in a Newtonian approach and kind of relativity way. Uh, so yeah, it's not, no question. It's dark. Yeah, good on that. And matter. Uh, and I think my last uh, mystery here is uh, why is the universe uh, expanding? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, accelerating. It's, not staying the same, right? It's actually getting faster as time goes on. And Einstein gets to have the last laugh. If you put the cosmological constant back in, um, you, get, uh, you get an accelerating universe, uh, which we now call dark energy. Unfortunately, we know even less about dark energy than we know about dark matter. And oh, I guess there's one more mystery. Why even was there a Big Bang? Uh, are we nothing more than... Uh, quantum accident, quantum fluctuation, maybe. I promised a solution to Olber's paradox. Uh, who, who solved it? It was Edgar Allan Poe uh, in 1848. So this uh, anticipates the discovery of the Big Bang by uh, about uh, over, well, around a century. Uh, he writes that the distance of the invisible background is so immense that no ray from it has yet been able to reach us at all. In other words, the universe may be infinite in extent, but it is not infinitely old, and he is exactly right. Uh, even today, we can only see out to about 13.8, and I'll use units of light years, because it's easy, 13.8 billion light years, uh, give or take, because the universe is about 13.8 billion years old. That does not mean that's how big the universe is. That's just how far we can see. So there we are. That's it. And uh, let's see. Well, I, I guess I stopped screen sharing now, right? Uh, oh, yeah, there we are. So, do we get any questions? Yeah. So we got we got a few questions. Um, so the first one is by David Dixon from seventy six. And so his question is going to be. What do you think of Harvard cosmologist Avi Loeb's theory that the object known as Oumuamua, I think that, which was identified yeah, passing right. through our solar system in, in October 2017, uh, may have been a vessel launched by an extraterrestrial civilization? Yeah, 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 that's right. So, for the benefit of everyone else, I'll just sort of repeat. Uh, yeah, so Oman on now and it is it, definitely extra. Um, Outside of our solar system, uh, based on its velocity, uh, it has a hyperbolic orbit, which must mean that it came from outside the, uh, the solar system. Uh, and uh, it appears to have uh, accelerated. Uh, so you can't account for its motion um, just by uh, 
Newtonian laws. Uh, oh, and it has. Uh, you can look at if you look at its light curve. It's 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 highly irregular. So that that suggests that it uh, has a very high aspect ratio. So these are weird things. Usually stuff that comes. I mean, we get stuff from outside the solar system, uh, but it's usually rock rock things, and they're sort of like spherical ish. And Avila concludes, hey, you know what? I think this is a deal from uh, somebody else, and uh, it's uh, it's un you know, we're going under propulsion. Uh, I can't say he's wrong, but I don't believe. I, I don't, you know, it, uh, it doesn't seem likely. So recently, very recently, somebody made, I, I think, made a good uh, proposal, and that is, if you if you think back to the pictures we see, we've seen of Pluto, we have this uh, uh, crusty, frozen nitrogen uh, surface, and if a Pluto-esque planet uh, suffered some sort of a collision. Uh, a, a piece of that, like a potato chip, would break off, uh, might break off, and then float around and eventually come through our solar system. And uh, solar pressure, the solar sail concept, can account for because now now the thing's very thin, right? And its mass is very it's, it's large in extent, but but also low in mass. And uh, when you do that, then um, just the radiation pressure from the sun can account for the movement. So I kind of like that. Explanation. Um, I wish it was ET. Uh, that'd be fun, but I'm I'm going with the Pluto chunk. Okay, and then David Dixon follows that up by asking. Okay, so this one's a funding question. Are benefactors of the astronomical community excessively conservative in research funding? thereby discouraging unorthodox thinking. For, ex for instance, there is little funding for the study of extraterrestrial life, while multiverse theory, which is not empirically based, receives ample funding in comparison. Yeah, yeah, so right. Yeah, SETI in, in that. Um, no, no, there's definitely a group thing going on, and I think there is uh, an issue. Ultimately, part of the problem is that, so Yuri Milner, I think it is, uh, is, um, I think I have that right, is, is funding a, a lot of SETI, so a, a private investor. But the problem with getting uh, funding for uh, something like SETI, which I think is exactly the right thing to do, I completely agree with that, and it, it you know, I, I'm not influenced by the fact that I love the movie Contact, but uh, if you, if it's through a public source, like say the NSF, then some senator is going to get a hold of that, and they're going to say, look at this, we're spending money trying to find extraterrestrials. Which isn't going to apply politically, so it's a it's a politically tough thing to do. Whereas if um, you, you're funding something else, a very complex subject, uh, and which is basically indecipherable to the average person, uh, then you're politically um, you're you're okay politically. So yeah. Great. Okay. And so the next question is was posted um, was asked by by a twelve year old named Scott Hooper. I'm going to take this one because it's the it's one of the few questions that I can answer. <laughs> so uh, Scott's question is, how fast is the universe expanding? So um, the universe is expanding at a rate of approximately 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So for if there's some galaxy an entire megaparsec away from us, um, it's going to be expanding at it's going to be traveling away from us at 70 kilometers per second. If there's a galaxy two megaparsecs away, it'll be um, traveling away from us with an additional 70 kilometers per second. Now, something that's very cool about this is that um, we're actually not super sure uh, how fast the universe is expanding. So some data suggests that it's somewhere around 73 kilometers per second per megaparsec, and some research has suggested that it's 69. And the more work that gets done on both ends, says just reduces to error bars and so yeah, right right they're not lined up but they're all, they're close to each other but not lined up and not within within each other's error bars which suggests that someone somewhere is wrong or we might not understand our universe as well as we think we do either way um a very interesting problem that is currently called the hubble tension um so yeah that's a good question yeah, really good question. Yeah, yeah, really good.
Is that it? No more questions? Yeah. I, yeah, I think those were all the other questions. I think, oh, just kidding. Um, so new question came in. So you wrote off the, the dark ages. Uh, how much was going <laughs> on in non-European astronomy, such as Indian, Arab, or Chinese? Yeah, 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 right. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. So uh, 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 for the longest time, Muslim uh, uh, observers uh, were... Uh, they were doing a lot of good work, and um, yeah. So sorry about that. Uh, I, I, I had to get five thousand years into um, forty-five minutes. So no, that's that's quite right. Um, yeah, there was stuff going on. Yeah, it, outside of just the Earth. a lot of good stuff. And and do you know if they they were also on the heliocentric model or? Um... You know, uh, like, uh, I don't know. Okay. Don't know. Okay, that was a good last question to close on. Um, so I think with that, thank you everybody for coming. This was definitely a fun presentation to do and I hope that it was a fun presentation for all of you to watch. Uh, remember Paul and I love, love each other very much. Um, and I think with that, I will let Amy take it away and close out the presentation.